Yeah. And I also want to talk about uh, hen placement. I tend to have my hens facing the opposite direction of where I think the, the turkeys or the gobbler is going to come from. The reason I like that is I want as many of my decoys facing me so that an incoming turkey sees a path of direction and knows that those birds are looking towards me and oftentimes pretty close to me. And if they're all, if my decoys are looking in my direction, the incoming bird knows that they have that direction covered visually and they'll tend to come in a little more aggressively because they, one, are kind of slipping in the back door, but two, they know that if there was a problem in front of these birds, they would actually be turning around and facing back the other direction. Just curious your thoughts on the direction of the remaining hen decoys, if you put any preference to that. Um, but that's something I've always tried to do is get the hens facing the hunter. Because and it may not make a big difference, but I feel like an incoming bird is going to realize that, hey, everything's cool. Those feeding hen decoys heads are down. The one uh, hen with her head up is looking in the direction and she's not showing any posture of, you know, there's a problem and they come in, uh, uh, you know, hotter, if you will. I like it. And, and I take it even one step further. Now, if I'm in a, if I'm set up in a spot where I know the birds usually kind of linger and hang out for a while, I might just have their, their, uh, head directions just kind of more scattered. But I, I agree with you because it, I just remember when I was just talking about having late season, just having hens and having a couple feeders, you know, I have one like maybe upright and then a couple feeders. I will have the feeders pointing in a single direction away from where I think the bird is coming from. And I wasn't even thinking about it from a standpoint of safety. I was thinking of it from a standpoint of, I want that other Turkey to believe that those hens, already have a direction in mind and it's not in the direction of that gobbler they're moving away from him oh i love they're that pointing. i love that so he, he it's gonna pull. he's gonna look up see it and be like oh they're going the other way i got to get around them yes i've got to catch up they're 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 feeding they're moving in this direction so you know let's just say left and right so me the hunter is facing forward the, the gobbler is off to my left and I know I need to put my decoys out. If I know that I'm just on the edge of a field and the general feeding area is off to my right, I might take all of my hands and point them facing to my right. And I'll actually have them set up off to my right a little bit. So that way they're already moving to my right. Gobbler comes around the creek bend. He sees that setup. Now, if I have a Jake or a Strutter, it's going to be in, in front of me, but that Jake or Strutter is going to be behind those hens. Regardless if I have a Jake or Strutter in the setup, anyway, I'm having the hens pointed in the direction that is away from the gobbler. He's realizing that they're already headed somewhere. It's better, it's probably in his best interest just to, catch up with that group rather than stopping gobbling and trying to turn that group around and have them come back the other way. They're already headed somewhere. He's got to catch up. And then Chris, as late season comes, you talk about definitely pulling the strutter. You talk about going to sometimes just hen setups. Um, talk about that a little bit. That usually in my mind is typically a, a scenario where you, you get late season, and, and most of the breeding is done. Uh, turkeys are just worn out. The gobblers are just worn out. They've been in how many fights? They're probably injured. They've lost a bunch of their body condition just because they're not eating as much, and they're just they're just going full on, all out, all season long. So you may be in a month of season. Those gobblers are tired. They're they're just tired. Yeah, do they want ladies? Yes, they do. But do they want conflict? Hell, freaking no. And so. 
if and at that time, if you end up sitting in a situation where you have a hen, all of a sudden she's out there calling. By by the time we start rolling into quote unquote our later part of the season, that generally coincides again the way the states set up their hunting season. Generally, that coincides when those hens are starting to go off and lay it, you know, set on nests. Well, if all of a sudden late season here's a hen out there and she's calling. Oftentimes that can mean that maybe that hen lost her nest, and so she might be off on her own, or maybe it's a hen or two off on her own or three. Um, they're not looking for a gobbler. They're not looking for a jake. They're not looking for. They're just looking for an easy hen that wants you know, some company. And so that's why I'll just pull that and just have one or two or three hens um, when I'm running late season. Yeah. Um, would there ever be a situation where you would? in the late season run just a Jake decoy in, in the thought of, you know, like kind of bacheloring up or would that never, that would never strike you to do that. You'd, you'd run a single hand you know, before you run a single Jake. You know, I, it's, it's worth playing. You know what I mean? I, I can't, you never say never because I'm even thinking about a situation now where I broke that rule and I actually took a strutter out during, the late season because there was two gobblers that were running this particular part of the river bottom and i mean they just absolutely beat the ever living tar out of any other gobbler that ever even thought about stepping foot in their chunk of the real estate and so late season i was like oh i, I mean there was there were no hen all the hens were off i mean these two birds were just out there every day all every day all by themselves. They didn't have any hens. They were just out there strutting or just cruising the river bottom all by themselves. But every time a new Jake stepped foot in there, passing it, they would just run him ragged. So I'm like, fine, I'm going to come out there with my Jake strutter. And oh my gosh, I mean, it was just, it was like having an opening day again. They just about bowled him over. So there's always going to be those times where you just got to get creative and play. So you absolutely could. You absolutely could have a situation like that or, or you just you play with a jake you play with a strutter late it you just got to see what your birds are doing and, and how they respond to it that's the other reason why i do tell people just slowly just slowly start to accumulate decoys over time um because it's just it's nice to have a full toolbox and sometimes i'll have them all in the truck or i might even have them in the ground blind and i'm mixing and matching i'm pulling and i'm putting I, i'm just playing with the spread as I'm hunting to figure out, okay, what do these guys want? So, I, yeah, go for it. And I would say, too, I mean, guys that are hunting private land, if you're noticing that there's a dominant bird or two in different parts of your property, and, I mean, you are witnessing this bird literally chasing other birds off and he will not let them buy the hens and he's just super, super dominant, I mean, 100%, that's when I would absolutely get the real tail fan out, get the get the strutter out, and, and yeah. that, that bird will go. You can kill dominant birds with strutters because they absolutely, like Chris said, and that's one of the things I have the um, smaller uh, Jake strutter from DSD as well, and, you know, having that little bit body, smaller body size, pretty much any gobbler that's showing that they like to fight and they like that dominance, you put that smaller bodied decoy there, they're just going to come pummel it. Um, let's also talk while we're talking about decoys in more of a run and gun situation, not a blind situation, possibly, you know, a, a Merriam's mountain type hunt situation. I'm a lot of times going to carry a Jake, a DSD Jake, and I'm going to carry a DSD either upright or, or feeding hen. I'm going to carry two decoys if, if I'm on the move and I know that I'm going to be covering country, uh, whether I'm by myself or with someone else. Um, you know, normally I'll carry two decoys myself. Uh, they come with the, the DSDs come with the, you know, the bag with the nice strap on it. And so I'll usually carry a Jake and a hen. And if I'm hunting with someone else, normally I'll have them carry probably two other hens uh, in a in a normal run and gun situation. Um, Chris, any any changes to that? Nope. That's yeah, exactly. Or or uh, sometimes I'll just 
again, I'll just have the jake because I can at least set up where I can pretend the hen is somewhere where the incoming bird might not see. So, yeah, go minimal. That's And, and that is why I used to like it. it and it, don't get me wrong, I still love my avian X. And that's one thing that avian X has is uh, on the, the collapsible ones, the blow-up ones, is you can literally collapse them and have them in the back of your vest. They're heavy, but you can have them in the back of your vest, and they're pretty quiet, and you can deploy them when you need to or just stow them if you don't want to. But, yeah, a lot of times I'll just take one or two decoys. Sometimes it's just Jake. One thing we didn't talk about is the submissive pin that Dave Smith makes. And I just posted on Facebook a while back uh, a video where you had uh, Jonathan, an archery hunter, and you masterfully placed that submissive hen at a 90 degree angle. So at a perpendicular angle to the hunter. In other words, the, the submissive hen is longer left to right if that makes sense, and you position it, not the tail pointing at the hunter, not the head pointing at the hunter, but you put it in a perpendicular position so that if an incoming gobbler were to come in from behind the submissive hen, which they always do, they come in from behind and they approach and they jump up on, for an archer and or a shotgun hunter, always place those submissive hens at a true... um, 90 degree angle because it gives a perfect perpendicular head shot and or for archers a body shot if you're going to body shot but if you're head or neck shooting with archery it gives you that perfect side just perfect shot and it gives you also um, a lot of opportunity to you know have because they're going to get on it and they're going to spend some time you know clawing and it, it, you're, you're basically, your shot pattern, you're in the money the whole time with that. Chris, anything to add? Yeah, no, it's, that's exactly it. And the, other, the, only, the only thing that I'll add is people need to realize, too, is when, when you have a gobbler coming in, they are, because that, the whole point behind that submissive pen is that to indicate a body position that that hen is ready to breed. If she wants that gobbler to breed. In order for him to do so, he's got to climb up on her back. In order for him to do so, a lot of times they will come in from behind her. And when they do, oftentimes they just slow down. And they just start coming in gingerly. They get closer and closer and then start to test and start to step up. And they'll start. Just remember, if that bird is committed and he's buying this deal and he's approaching her back end, and he's testing on getting up on top of her, he's not going anywhere. Unless someone comes in and busts the, the, the setup, a bobcat comes in or something, that bird is going nowhere for many minutes. So just take your time, slow down, let the bird settle. And I mean that, especially for those people that are archery hunting, like this particular, yeah, that, that, that helps fun. Um, if you're just, if you're archery hunting with your butt against a tree and you're out in the open, okay, you're, the movement of you drawing that bow is going to be significant. So you have to make sure that that bird is either his head is blocked or he's so distracted he's not paying attention to anything. When you have the submissive hen on the ground like that and you give him time to start to climb up on her back, that bird is locked in and you can literally move your shotgun. You can literally draw your bow back and most of the time they aren't even going to react. If he does react, he's going to pick his head up and be like, what was that? Uh," And then you smack him in the head. Smack them in the head because a lot of times when they do get up on the back of that hen, they're not going to be in a full strut position. They're going to be kind of in this modified, squirrely position. You can see it in the video. Jay, I know you've got several of these videos because I filmed them and they're on your web, they're on your uh, YouTube channel. You can watch that bird get up on top of that back of that, that hen decoy and you'll watch how his head kind of just creeps out a little bit. His, his feathers kind of relax around his neck and his head is poked out a little bit to where you've got a perfect 
wide open head and neck shot for anybody that wants to, to lop their head off with a with a broad head or if you want to just smoke them with a shotgun. But just understand, that bird's not going anywhere. Do not feel like you're rushed. Just let him settle and just take your time and smack him. That leads me to the next question we've got here. Um, talk about archery shot placement. I'll let you run with this one, Chris. You know, let me just put it this way. Um, I think I'm going to start. I think for all of my archery hunts in the future, it's going to be limited to headshots only. I agree. Uh, um, I just, we, I have a video that extensively talks about um, it's on the YouTube channel. It extensively talks about shot placement on turkeys, and I do not. For okay, let's just talk about you. for arch. We've got two general schools of thought. One using a head chopper style broadhead, and you're going to smack them in the head with a with a broadhead, or you're going to take a body shot. If you're going to take a body shot, if you're just going to take a body shot my recommendation is you throw the biggest mechanical tur- biggest mechanical broadhead that you can you need to put a gargantuan hole in these birds because they're kill zone they're effective very quick ethical humane and recoverable consistently recoverable kill zone is about the size of a peach small peach large plum you people that are listening to this, you know, kill turkeys before you're like, oh, their 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 body cavity is bigger. Yeah, their body cavity is bigger than that, but most of it's full of guts and gizzard. And will you kill a turkey running a broadhead through the guts? Yes, you will. Will you recover that bird? That's a good question. So you'll hear people talk about shooting them in the wing butt, in the shoulder. You know, or and, and the theory is if you break that wing, then the, the, broad, the broadhead goes in the body, you break the wing, they can't fly off, and you can, you know, the bird either dies or you can, you can run them down and chase them down and catch them, okay? But the problem is where the wing butt is, where the shoulder is, there are, depending on the angle in which you shoot, there are no vitals up there except maybe his trachea. So if you get lucky and you break and you cut his trachea, okay, that's great. But if you miss the trachea, you're not hitting anything vital. You've just broken his wing, and no, he can't fly, but he's going to take off running, and good luck. If the other school thought was shooting him in the drumstick, in the high thigh portion of the body, break the pelvis, break the, the upper drum, the upper thigh bone. If you can break that pelvis, you can break the bone, they can't run very effectively, and they can't jump very effectively. If you break if you break the pelvis now if you if you just break one leg and you don't bust the pelvis you just break one leg no they can still jump up enough to fly and they can hop really darn fast and flop really darn fast and they can disappear on you that location of that pelvis and the thigh bone is in the gut pocket so is the bird going to die yes are you going to recover him good question so. I talk about a shot placement that is halfway between the where the thigh bone is and where the shoulder wing butt is. It, it's difficult to talk about without showing visuals, um, but in general, if you look at a turkey's wing, there's those bronze feathers, the, the band of bronze feathers on the, the, the right above the primaries and, and secondary feathers. If you draw a line between the shoulder, with the insertion point where the wing goes into the body, you'll see the crease of feathers where the where I, I really the, where his wing disappears into his body at the shoulder. And then you draw a line to the top edge of those bronze feathers and then go about halfway in between that is the heart lung area on the turkey. And the important thing for people to understand is our heart and lungs in most mammals, our heart and lungs are protected by our rib cage. On a bird, 
and, and so and our lungs are inside the body cavity, free floating on their own. On a bird, the lungs are actually interlaced in between the ribs, and the ribs are pretty darn substantial. Those ribs are attached to the spinal column. So if you can, and I'm trying to, it, it, I know it's on my, it, it's on the, the turkey module. I did, I'm not seeing it here on the YouTube channel, but I, I, I spend time with a, with a skinned out turkey with its wing and everything. So I'm showing you that if you go halfway between that shoulder insertion point and the top edge of the bronze feathers, in general, no matter how a bird is orienting his body, whether he's upright or whether he's in full strut, oftentimes the spine follows pretty darn well where if you draw a line between those two points and you go halfway between, you'll hit the heart and lungs. But more importantly, in order when you hit the lungs, you're going to go through those ribs. And when you go through those ribs, you are going to sever the backbone. That bird, that bird hits like a ton of bricks. It just hits like a ton of bricks. I'm working on a video right now from my personal hunt last year, and, and if I can, over this next, I'm, I'm going to be dead in the water on doing any habitat improvements over this next week because we're getting rain right now. I will try, Dick, Jay, do me a favor and remind me to make this happen. I need to put that video up on YouTube um, because I did a double. I had two birds come in. I had two birds come in. One, the first bird came in all by himself, smacked him, made it absolute perfect, flawless shot. That bird dropped like a ton of, ton of bricks. And I hit that bird exactly where I'm talking. I went out, recovered that bird, came back in. Another bird gobbled while I'm sitting there talking with my buddy. I'm like, well, here we go. And I jumped back in the ground blind, called the second bird in. The second bird comes in. I am aiming. I'm going to take the exact same body shot. And I was just a mere two inches off. And if it had not been for my buddy, there's no way I would have gotten that bird because we ended up filing out of that ground blind and we were in a little island of trees. My buddy was smart enough. He saw what was going on and he bailed out of the ground blind. He was able to go. We, we ran around that island in opposite directions and he cut that bird off because that bird was about to run down the river bottom. No way was I going to be able to keep up with him. Would the bird have died? Yeah, somewhere. The question is, is whether I would have recovered it. We were able to pin him down. I was able to get him to pull up in a, in a brush pile, and I was able to go in and, and get another shot on him and, and get him. I, I can, I, and Jay, I know you've seen this, and, I, and I'm dead serious when I say this. I think from now on, starting 2021, I think all of my archery hunts will be headshot hunting only because it doesn't take uh, you're off by one or two inches and you can run an arrow through the body cavity but you're you have a low percentage play of whether you're actually going to recover that bird what do you think yeah i mean the reality is i've seen way more birds run off than die from bows and i've seen a lot die from bows um what I've kind of come to, I've had a bunch of people, you know, send me messages on the ghouls and I say head and neck shots only if you touch the bird. If you hit the bird in any way, it's your bird, whether you get it or not. And I'm sorry I have to be this strict, but my birds are very, very precious to me and I don't have the ability to ding two birds yeah. and, and get one. So I... I and that's... And, and that's and I don't, and I, I apologize. I don't, I don't, I'm not trying to cut you off, but I, I want people to understand that. I don't think they understand it that well. Um, because when you're on public land or you're just doing your own thing and you're out chasing birds and it's just you, uh, you know, or just you and your buddy on a, a chunk of ground, it's, it's oftentimes easy to think, well, okay, well, you know, oh, I lost that bird, but I can go get another bird. Well, yeah, you can. But how many birds are out there? I mean, seriously, how many birds are out there on your landscape? And there's, and if you're on public ground, how many other people are out there as well? And, and how many birds are dying that are not being recovered? And for me, so you, are, it's, it's, it's incredibly important because what people don't understand is you're paying for each one of those birds. Right, I you have to pay have for it. Yeah, if, if the rancher finds a dead bird, I pay yeah. for it. So it's yeah, not like we can exactly. ding two or three of them in a week and be like, well, we didn't get them. 
when that cowboy yeah. rides up and finds it, which they will, but I would have already reported it at that point anyway, I got to pay for it. So, yeah. And, and I think it's even more than that, Chris. I mean, I think we owe every animal we shoot at, we owe them the quickest death possible. And quite honestly, I, I mean, I've been around some of the best archers in the world and I've taken some of the best archers in the world and they're phenomenal shots and they can hit that small little plum spot like Chris is talking about nine times out of ten but I've seen a lot of them get away and I know they're eventually dying so I say head and neck only with expandable or magnus bullhead type lop the head off you know if you hit with pretty much any broadhead you hit that neck region that bird's dead if you hit the, the head region, that bird's dead. I don't really care what broadhead you have. If you hit that, it's going to die. If you clip the neck, if you cut the windpipe, if you hit the brain, it, it's going to die. So I've basically told a few guys that have inquir- inquired about this year, next year, 2022, I'm sorry, it's, I'll take archers, but it's head and neck only. And if you don't like that, go somewhere else. And my reality of someone who, you know, we were scheduled to shoot 75 birds this year, you know, for the last 10 years, you know, I've seen a lot of birds die every year, you know, 40, 50, 60 birds a year. And, and others out there, other outfitters in, you know, Merriam's and Rio's are seeing 100, 150 Osceola's, a lot of birds. The reality is, It's not a great weapon of choice for a turkey because the margin of error is so great. If you don't hit that plum sized, you're probably killed it, but it's, you'll probably never find it. So, and I, I know I'll get emails on this and I don't care. I have enough experience. Chris has enough experience to go ahead and it seems like the older I get, the more I kind of like, I know you can kill a turkey with a bow, but why? Why do you have to try and shoot it with a bow when most of the time people I know shoot two or three before they get the one that they kill? That's the reality. Most people that archery hunt turkeys, for every one they kill, they wound one. I'm not into that. I, I just, I'm not into that. So head and neck shot, and I think the turkey, to be honest with you, is a perfect shotgun animal. Like, it's a perfect animal to shoot in the face, in the neck, with a shotgun. And we owe it to the animal to kill him as quickly as possible. You talk about high leg and, you know, go up the leg and shoot the bronze patch and all that. How many birds that you've seen in your career shot with a bow that you're chasing through the, the landscape, chasing them? You're literally trying to jump on them. You're trying to, you know, hedge them. You're trying to chase them. For every one you killed, I guarantee there's one or two that you're chasing. Yeah. It, it, I mean, that's the thing is it happens. Now, I'm a bow hunter. I love, I do love bow hunting turkeys. Um, but, uh, well, there's a simple it, solution. It, it, Just head or neck shot them, and, and then it's either correct. a dead miss or it's a 99% that you're going to kill them. Yeah, it, exactly. I mean, I, yeah. And, and I, the reason why this, has really hit me lately is because I, I have the same policy on my hunts, whether it's deer hunts or turkey hunts, and it's in the paperwork. It says, you know, you and I, I have it to where people initial next to each bullet item, and, and this is one. If you draw blood on that animal, that is, that's your animal. And you have to because you just don't want somebody out there just flinging arrows and, or just slinging bullets and just wounding everything out there in, in, you know, on the landscape. So, and the thing is, is people, and I know that you've dealt with it, people have no problem sitting there at the house or the lodge or whatever and signing that. And you're like, yep, 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 yep. No, I understand. Absolutely. That makes sense. I, I completely understand that. And then the, then the situation happens. And the arrow goes through the body cavity of a bird. The bird takes off. Or the arrow goes through the whitetail and the blood trail runs out and we can't find them. And it's day two of a seven day hunt, or it's the first day of their three day turkey hunt. And they're only, they've only bought one bird or like in my area, I've restricted everybody this year to most everybody to, to one bird, uh, because our population isn't as robust as it used to be. 
So now it's on day one, and you just put an arrow through a bird, and the people are like, well, well, but that one, he should be fine. I, I, it should be fine. It really wasn't. It, it's like, okay, we're not going to backpedal, and we're not going to play this game. We, that's why I went through this with you in the beginning, and you understood and agreed that if you draw blood on, if the arrow goes through the body cavity of that animal, that's your bird. Well, but, you know, if, if it survives, well, it's like, okay, here we go. It, it becomes this issue of, golly, we, like, we can't, I don't have the number of birds to have a, I don't have the number of birds to have a 20% wounding loss. I right. don't. I, I really want to maximize it as much as possible. So I think we're going to just limit it to head and neck only. But you, you can, I don't want to discourage people from taking body shots. If you take a body shot and you know where you're hitting, it's deadly. But all you have to be is plus or minus a couple inches. And geez, oh, Pete, now here we go. That's why I say use the biggest honking mechan- – there's turkey mechanical broadheads or mechanical broadheads made for turkey hunting. There are massive – use them. The bigger the hole you put through that bird, the faster they shut down, the more likely you're going to recover them. If you're just, I, I, anybody who listens to me knows I love iron wheel broadheads. I shoot them for almost all of my big game hunting. I do not use an iron wheel head for turkey hunting. It's just too small for me in a high percentage play of recovery. You want a big hawk in the heck mechanical. Yeah, because it's not a oh, penetra- it's not a penetration issue. It's a yeah, you want to no, you, no. you know implode the bird. You basically want to punch a softball size hole through the bird and have as much trauma to that bird as quickly as you possibly can. Because even if you yeah. don't hit the sweet spot, but you have inflicted a giant hole in the bird, a lot of times you can run after them and jump on them and stand on their head. If you go with speed and go slicing through them very very quickly, yeah, I mean you're not going to find them. You, you, you're yeah. not going to find him. Let's let's move yeah. on here. Okay, hopefully hunting a new unit this spring. Land features, terrain, vegetation to look for. Oh, where where say that? Okay, say that again. Where is the where are they hunting? Uh, pick. It says. Hopefully, I'll be hunting a new unit this spring. Land features, terrain, vegetation to look for. So he didn't tell me which state. He oh. didn't tell me. But let's just assume it's someone hunting Merriam's. Hopefully hunting a new unit this spring. Land features, terrain, vegetation to look for. Go ahead. Yeah, go, go ahead, Jay. Go ahead. Go so ahead. Dive in. land features and terrain... Um, if we're specifically talking Merriam's turkeys, um, I am going to look for my favorite thing to hunt Merriam's turkeys is Ponderosa pine. Uh, I like Ponderosa pine forest and it doesn't necessarily have to be solid pines, but I like having those areas, uh, where you've got some, you know, like big open meadows and then you've got stringers of pines, maybe down in the little canyons uh, and then I also like, you know, the, the straight ponderosa where everything around you is solid ponderosa pine. Land features that I look for when I'm looking at a new unit for turkeys specifically are I want to know where the water is. Turkeys in, in specifically Arizona, New Mexico, um, they need water. In some of these units where snow, you know, kind of comes and goes and, you know, by turkey season, it's pretty darn popcorn fart dry around. I want to know where the water is, whether it be live water or stock tanks or windmills or, or, or whatever. I want to know where the water is. The next thing I look for is what type of terrain are they going to be roosting in? A lot of times turkeys like contour breaks. They like ridge lines. So if I can find an area that has nice, long, predominant type ridge lines where if you were to walk uh, on top, you know, maybe it's 30 to 50 yards, um, kind of a flatter type top, and then it drops off on both sides. That gives a great area for birds to be up on those tops, strutting around and feeding and doing all whatever they're going to do. And then they can glide right off the sides and roost along those ridgelines. Turkeys 
especially Merriam's, typically like to roost on those contour breaks, on those ridgeline areas. Um, so that's what I'm going to look for. When I'm, when I'm looking at a new unit, uh, I like to go a couple weeks before the season, and I'm specifically going to be looking for tracks. The way I look for tracks is I like to go to these water holes. I like to identify them on my Onyx maps, or on my Google uh, Earth, and then I like to mark them on my Onyx, and then I like to actually visit those tanks and make a circle around the tank and look for tracks, whether it be in the mud, uh, up at the water's edge, or the dust, or the dirt, or snow, or whatever was around the tank. I want to find as many turkey tracks and turkey droppings as I can, look for feathers. I also like to get out and walk along roads and in the bar ditch right next to the road, a lot of times you'll see tracks and a lot of times birds, if you are, whether it be a main type, like county gravel road or a two track road, if you spend enough time walking, you're going to end up seeing a lot of sign and a lot of tracks. So I am looking for sign. I'm looking for sign at their water. Uh, and then what I'm going to be doing a couple weeks before the season in a new unit is I'm going to be covering country, trying to figure out and, and locate as many birds where they roost as possible. So in any given morning or evening, um, a lot of times during the day is when I'm looking at water holes, I'm lo walking, looking for tracks, but I spend the morning and the evening and I'm going to say the, the 30 minutes before the sun comes up, while the sun's coming up and 30 minutes after the sun comes up in the morning listening i like to be up on those same ridge lines listening where i can hear a big expanse a big area of country in the evenings i'm doing the same thing i'm i'm listening uh, say an hour before it gets dark i'm just listening at a canyon's edge where i can hear and see several fingers uh, looking across a canyon where there's several ridge lines where, I've, you know, they've got lots of options to roost. And I'm trying to basically roost as many birds as I can prior to my season. And I'm trying to establish where are those roosting sites that the birds typically like to hang out so that by the time the season starts, I've got 7, 8, 10, 12, 14, 30 roost sites where I've heard birds and I've pinpointed on my onyx and I've marked on my onyx then as and the other thing that I'm looking for in land features and geography is I'm looking for where are places where people that drive on a main forest or county road can just stop and hear the same birds that I'm listening to so a lot of times I'll pick ridge lines that have been blocked off by the forest service or areas that are not accessible by a vehicle. And if I can find birds in those type of areas, I know that I have a better chance that possibly people won't be on those birds. I also like to cover ground in my vehicle with my coyote howler, driving and stopping and blowing the coyote howler and covering as much country in a small amount of time as I can. You only have about 20 to 30 minutes of prime time when they're up on the limb, up on the roost where they're going to be gobbling uh, after it gets dark. So you want to cover from that fly up time to say 30 minutes, even 45 minutes after that, just driving, stopping every half mile, blowing the coyote howler. If you get a bird or two to answer, mark it as best you can and then just keep going and, you know, I'll cover in that 30 minutes, I'll drive around like a madman trying to establish as many roosted birds as possible. Chris, I'll let you go for a while. I want to take a second here and thank the sponsors of the podcast. I want to thank GoHunt.com, my friend Cody Nelson, the glassing guru. He's the optics manager at GoHunt.com gear shop. If you have any optical needs at all, give Cody a call directly at 702 847 8747. You can also send him an email at optics at gohunt.com. You can also text him at 602-399-3699. I want to thank Go Hunt for their sponsorship. Also remind you guys we're in application season. The Go Hunt Insider is the best western hunting resource tool out there. It's got the best draw odds and harvest statistics uh, available. 
You can go to gohunt.com forward slash J Scott. Just by signing up, you're going to get a $50 Go Hunt Gear Shop gift card. I want to thank gohunt.com. I also want to thank Kuyu. That's K U I U. Uh, Kuyu Ultralight Hunting, Kuyu.com. Uh, Kuyu is the gear that I wear on all of my hunts. Phonescope.com, I want to thank them. Use the JScott20 promo code. You're going to get a 10% discount on all orders. Onxmaps.com, use the JScott20 promo code. You're going to get a 20% discount on all orders at Onyx Maps. And then ApexMunition.com. Apex Ammunition, it's the home of the TSS, the Tungsten Super Shot. That is the shotgun shells that I'm going to be using on my upcoming turkey hunts. Go to apexmunition.com to find out more. Guys, let's get back to the episode. No, you you, you nailed it, dude. Um, and while I, I wanted you to tackle it because I've been, I, I, always, I always talk, but I wanted to see just how close you and I were on this. The funny thing is, is everything that you just said, is exactly what I do. And again, if people want to see it, that you, if people have not been to your YouTube channel and all the stuff that, all the turkey, turkey stuff that you have there, they need to go there. And if you want to watch everything Jay just said, pretty much, me doing it from eight years ago, Again, watch that same video, that big, you can go to my YouTube channel. It's just, it's, it's a long, you got to scroll back. Big New Mexico, Marion's Turkey. The entire thing about that YouTube, it's 30 minutes long, roughly 30 minutes long. The entire video is talking about this exact thing. And Jay, you nailed it. I mean, right, and the funny part is, it's right down to, okay, I've got multiple birds. Which one am I going to go to and set up on? I'm going to go to the one off to the side or further back in because I'm going to play the bet that any other public land guy that's going to come up this valley or gal is going to come up this valley, they're going to hit the first bird and they're going to go straight to the first bird that's goblin. Let all the other people fight over that bird. I'll go two or three birds further back in with the, with the hope that at least I have an hour in the morning to play with those birds before the rest of the hunters work their way up in those ridges or in that valley. It's, it, you nailed it. It, it. You nailed it. So it's perfect, dude. It, it was perfect. Well, something, oh. else, something else that come to my mind, too, is if you're hunting with buddies and, you know, you're camped and, you know, you go out and let's say the season and boom, you got your bird. I'm one, you know, sometimes guys are like, man, can't we just enjoy this? I'm like, I'm enjoying it right now. Get in the truck. Let's go. We're going to listen off different <laughs> points because I'm trying to roost birds for everybody else that I'm hunting with. Or I'm, I'm trying to go, Hey, you didn't do any good. Well, after I shot my bird, we drove, we walked out to a point. We just sat down there for 15, 20, 30 minutes and we listened and we heard three different birds. You know, you, you've got a place. I'll, we'll go back there this afternoon. We've got a place to start. So I'm documenting the whole time that I'm hunting, whether I'm scouting or hunting, I'm documenting, trying to establish, trying to get as many hot spots as I can, trying to get as many known locations of gobblers so that we have, you know, because a lot of times on public ground, you're going to, your first five birds are going to be shot. You'll pull up and there'll be a vehicle parked there and you've got to have other places to go. So I never rest. I want, I'm wanting to, at prime time, I'm never going, ah, let's just drive back and we're not even going to stop. No, half the time I've stopped, you know, seven, eight, ten times back to camp just trying to hear other birds for anyone else that I would be hunting with. And I'm just kind of a junkie that way. I just, I love hearing new birds. There's, I don't know how to explain it, but there's something about stopping, walking out, just, you know, 30 seconds walking out a minute out to a canyon edge and just sitting there and blowing a coyote howler and having a bird gobble. I mean, I'm, I've been doing this a long time and I'm, I'm as excited now about a bird gobbling on a limb as I was when I first started. And for those turkey hunters out there that have the passion for it, they know exactly what we're talking about, Chris, when we talk about, you know, I get as excited, you know, I'll see 
uh, you know, depends on how this coronavirus is, but I'll probably see personally 45 or 50 birds get shot myself this year. And it's the same feeling every time. I have yet to get where it's just like, eh, it's another bird, let's go. Like I get all yeah, exactly. amped up. I get adrenaline. I get, you know, just, I, I get that feeling. And I guess until that feeling goes away, you know, I've, I've never encountered a situation that, you know, where we call in a bird and it gets shot where I'm not just super amped and it's the coolest thing. I, you know, that's how much I enjoy it. I hope that everyone listening is able to get to a point where they have enough success that they can feel that one of, one of the things I struggled, um, you know, early on, it was hard and luckily I stayed with it. Um, but I just fear some people out there have a tough hunt or two or three or four years and they don't fully engage. I would encourage you. Turkey hunting is one of those things that once you really get into it, it's, it's a lifelong passion for sure. Oh yeah. 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 Um, now two things came to mind when you were talking there. Number one, don't misconstrue the fact that by about day 30, nonstop day 30 of turkey hunting, I might not want to roll out of bed as, as eagerly at three <laughs> o'clock in the morning like I did on opening day. But, we're, but every time that bird gobbles and then I'm and, the, and here they come strutting in, it's like, Oh yeah, that's why I'm doing this. That's right. Now I remember. Yeah. So it, yeah, it's one thing. It's funny. Cause all the time, you know, um, you know, my well, your hunts too. It's a three day long hunts. You know what I mean. So the, everybody shows up, and it, it's funny for uh, for me out here. Is I tell people, okay, show up on the evening of this day, and then our hunt starts the next morning, and then there we go. Well, you know, I put a day between my hunts because I've got to get a bunch of stuff done between you know, just logistically, but invariably, invariably, someone will send me a text that you know I said show up this evening before your hunt okay it's noon and they're like we're 30 minutes out we'll be right there he's like oh i've i've got like all day of the, i've, I've got to get stuff done but people are just you're our hunters are coming out they're on vacation and they're just camped and, and just going crazy they're just ready for the hunt and it's awesome and that energy also is what helps drive the whole thing and i agree with you there are some people that say, oh, I just don't understand this turkey hunting thing. Oh, I just don't get it. Then, then you need to, I don't care what you think about outfitters or guided hunts or whatever. You know what? And, and just book a hunt. Go book a hunt with a good outfitter so you can experience what it actually is like. So you, don't go out and flounder for it. I mean, if, if you want just a taste of it, just go book a hunt and get a good taste of it. Get the juices flowing and then go out and, and have fun because once you enjoy, once you taste what good turkey hunting can be like, oh my gosh! Yeah. The other thing too is now I will say this: I agree with everything you said, but if you're on public ground, I, I say this all the time with with bugling and with elk. Be careful. We all love to hear a bird gobble. We all love to hear a bull elk bugle. But if you're on public ground and that bird's gobbling and you're getting them cranked up, say you're roosting them the night before, if there's other people out there listening and you're just blowing the coyote howl just because you want to hear them gobble, understand you're you're letting everybody else on the landscape know where that bird is as well. So definitely go out and, and shock gobble birds and, and figure out where they are. But if he gobbles once and you're like, man, he's right there, don't just keep him cranking for the sake of just keeping him cranking. Because all you're going to do is just shoot yourself in the foot the next morning when, you know, four other people are all, you know, set up on the same ridge around it. You know what I mean? So you got it. It's fun to listen to him. To, it's fun to listen to them gobble on the roost. But uh, if you're on public ground in a, in an especially a heavily hunted area, just be careful on how much you get him fired up because you might end up calling in other hunters as well. Yeah, I mean, I would even reiterate, if you're out on a point edge and you hear some birds and you hear, and you hear them fly up and then you pull up your binos and you're spot and there's a gobbler and he's kind of getting settled on his limb and he hasn't gobbled or anything, do not 
If you see the <laughs> gobbler, do not call to the gobbler. You see him. There is no need to get him to gobble. Correct. Do not Correct. leave him alone. The more, and, and I will argue with anybody about this, the night before, let's say you're far enough away, they're not going to, like, they're not seeing you or anything. But if you're just screwing with the bird and just getting them to answer and getting them, and you're, whoo, 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 and then you're doing the coyote, and then, oh, let's see if we'll answer a peacock, and then let's see if we'll answer the truck door. I see people do this. I've seen it, and I'm like, why? Well, let's see if we'll answer the crow. Exactly. Why? Let's see if we'll answer the bugle. Yeah. Why? Like, we're going to hunt that bird. And they're like, oh, yeah. it, it doesn't yeah. matter. They don't have a memory. They, they, they won't remember. I'm like, dude, you haven't done this long enough. I guarantee you we go set up on that bird in the morning and you've just blown him, you know, made him blow his top off all night long to every sound you make. You don't think they remember that? I argue. Heck, yeah, they do. They know well, if someone's if, if thinking not, with them. Else, yeah, if, if nothing else, you, you're just going to make it hard. You're just going to make it harder for you later on. Yeah, not to mention everybody in the county who hasn't heard a bird gobble, and you're just ripping this thing off of the limb, trying to you know he's gobbling at everything you do. You're just attracting attention. Yeah, exactly. Well, it, here's a question for you. Um, I was going to say, what next question do you have? Because quite honestly, that topic that we're talking about right now dovetails with exactly the question I just got today, where uh, that hunter he was from uh, up in Oregon. And he was saying that, you know, he was mountain birds. They were hunting a, a particular area that did not used to have a lot of high, you know, a lot of pressure. And the birds were gobbling and, and they had a successful hunt. and They had a blast and it was just a great, you know, your, your picture perfect type of uh, turkey hunt. Fast forward now a couple of years and they're coming back in there and they know that it now has heavy pressure. And he's been up there and he's like, I can't, I can't get a bird to gobble at all i don't i don't hear anything now no, my number one question with him was you know would be okay are you seeing tracks you know i mean if if all of a sudden the birds are have gone silent the question is are the birds there now we you and i just on this i don't know how i don't even have a clue how many whether you're going to leave this in one podcast or we're going to have to split this up into another seven part series but uh you know we previously talked about birds following the snow line and, and how they move in the winter and the spring. And so obviously this person needs to think about all those things and whether the birds are even there in that area as of yet based on snowpack and spring green up and stuff. But I see this all the time. And that's why I think it's relevant for this topic is so many people go out there and call it. And, and we were just talking, you know, Jay, you were just talking, we were just talking about, you know, shot gobbling them. But the other thing that comes up, and I tell people all the time, do not just go when you're scouting, don't go out there running on ridges, you know, with a box call or a mouth diaphragm or a slate. Don't be going out there and calling, using hen sounds, turkey sounds, calling just to scout. And I'm talking like two weeks before season, a week before season. Leave them alone. Going out there and getting, leave them alone and don't, don't. If you want, if you need them to, if you need them to gobble in order for you to know where they are, then use a shot gobble. Don't use a hen sound because they're they're at this time they're trying to figure out where everybody is on the landscape. And I see people calling. This is where I will agree to, for those people to say, "Oh, you're calling too much and too often." Yeah, if you're if you're on preseason scenario and you're just out calling to find birds. The more they respond to a hen sound, they gobble, and then you move on. Well, they're there all day. That bird may gobble two, three, four, 20 times at you, and then shut up. And you're like, oh, that was awesome. And then you move on. Well, maybe over the next three hours, that bird walks his way up the ridge trying to find the bird he was just gobbling to. And he doesn't find anybody. He can't find anybody, and no one flies up that evening. All of a sudden, this hen that he was he was gobbling at just vanishes off the face of the earth. Well, you may go down the, the ridge and be gone that day, but tomorrow, here comes another person doing the exact same thing. And then the next day, another person, exact same thing. The more times a bird responds to a hen sound 
and then does not have a hen either show up or he can't find a hen only predisposes him later on to not vocalize to a hen sound. He'll stay tight-lipped and he won't say anything and he might just come in silence. So we end up doing a disservice for our own hunts, let alone other people's hunts. Because that's the thing, and Jay, I know for a fact you've heard this because I've been down there and, and working with you. When you deal with, when you get to hunt with people from all over the United States, I cannot tell you how many times you'll hear people say, oh, well, Rio Grande turkeys are easy. Oh, well, Merriam's are easy. Oh, Gould's turkeys are easy. Nothing compares to an eastern, you know, uh, an eastern turkey in Mississippi or eastern wild turkey in Pennsylvania or this or, or eastern baloney. Nothing compares an educated bird. Versus an uneducated bird. Yeah, I think uneducated un, uneducated birds are fun and easy. Educated birds, no matter the subspecies, are a nightmare. So don't educate them. Yeah, I mean, leave them alone. Uh, you know, the the least human interaction that you can have, the better, uh, for sure. And you know, going to your guy from Oregon's question. Um, going back to it, just some thoughts that are coming through my head are, Hey man, things might've changed that you might need to find a new area. Don't, don't waste your whole season. If you're up there scouting and you're like, there's no birds here. We don't hear any, we, you know, but are you there? You know, is this question coming right now? Cause we're in March. There are not, nothing's going to be happening. I mean, typically that Oregon, Washington area, you know, it's a real, you know, late April, a lot of great hunting in May situation. So maybe they're just not vocal. Maybe they're not gobbling yet. But like Chris yeah, said, if you're not seeing the sign, if you're not seeing the tracks, your spot may not be any good anymore. You might need to move on and find another spot. I mean, don't go your whole season going off of two or three years ago knowledge of, oh yeah, we had a really good hunt. You might've just had one really good year where there was a um, you know, a good recruitment. There was a bunch of birds and maybe something happened, you know, maybe, a, you know, the pressure moved in and maybe they whacked a bunch of birds and maybe the mo birds moved off. So I would be covering country, trying to find pockets of birds. And I don't know what the saying is, but basically don't waste your hunt on the honey hole. That's no longer a honey hole. Yeah, don't don't hunt them where you want them to be. Hunt them where they are. Exactly. I think that's that's very well said. Yeah. No, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly, and that is exactly what I. If if he was if we were talking to him now, that's what I'd say is okay. Number one, let's let's look at your snowpack. Let's look at your weather. Are the birds in? Do they have the ability to be at that location elevationally, right now or not? If because I agree, it's a little early. Maybe they've had a, a spring thaw, and maybe. Things are, are going well there, or it's a lower elevation area, and things are greening up, and, and this is the time that the birds should be there. Okay, that's fine. But just evaluate that spring green up. Where are the birds going to be based on that spring green up? Number one. Number two, same thing, Jake. I, I, I'm literally thinking of the places I used to hunt in Colorado on the Rampart Range. Um, it, there was a couple places that used to be absolutely incredible. I used to kill birds there every single year consistently. And now it is a sea of turkey hunters, and it's very difficult to find a bird in there because the birds have literally moved, and they're occupying different areas now that are, are a little bit more inaccessible. So because of hunter pressure and uh, just pressure in general, you may actually see a shift in movement and behavior and where they are on the landscape. So, like you said, Jay, you need to be out there. Don't rely on vocalizations, per se. You need to be out there. Snow. You know, are you seeing tracks in snow? Are you seeing tracks in muddy, soft areas? Are you seeing strut marks on the gravel, dirt roads? How many times are you down in Mexico? I know I am out here with Rio's. You're driving down a road, or you're driving, you're going down a two track, or whatever. You, you all of a sudden, you just see the strut marks in the road, in the dirt. I mean, that right there, that visual sign. Are you seeing droppings? Are you, you know, people will say, "Are you looking for feathers?" I don't. I'm not a big fan of looking for feathers because a, they can blow away, and or 
Well, he may have a bird may have been molting last fall and dropped that wing feather there, and it's going to stay there. So feathers can be a little tricky as far as scouting sign is concerned. But fresh droppings, tracks, are you seeing sign? And if and if the answer is no, well then the birds have got to be they're not there yet, or you just got to keep looking. But if you are seeing sign, okay, then you know the birds are there. And that's where if they're going if they're not going to gobble, and I talk about this extensively on the on the, the turkey module part about different sizes of populations will have different effects. If you have a, a an area that has a good population of birds, and oftentimes you'll hear more gobbling because those birds are used to the fact that there's other birds around and there's there's mixing of birds. But if you're an area that has a very, very tiny population, those birds may spend all year together, summer and winter. They might not bust up, and they might absolutely know that there are no other birds on this landscape. And so all of a sudden they hear new turkey sounds, and they're like, what is that? Who the heck? It, it stands out as an anomaly and so they instantly become very, very cautious. So there's some reasons biologically why the birds might be tight-lipped as well. Um, it, it all depends on what the, the, excuse me, the survivability of some of the adults was and what the hatch success was. If you have an area that has a lot of two-year-olds, say a good air, say you say your state agency just did a, a turkey reintroduction into an area, or birds are pioneering into an area, and the habitat's great and the hatch success is good, or they released a bunch of young birds into an area, and you've got a bunch of two-year-olds out there, well, statistically, two-year-olds gobble a lot more than maybe mature, uh, a single mature tom will. So in those years where you stumble into a good nest success, and a good hatch, where all of a sudden now, two years later, you've got a pile of, of two-year-olds out there, you're going to hear a pile of gobble. But you may have a year where you had really piss poor nest success, or back-to-back years like we had out here, where all of a sudden now you don't have young birds on the landscape. All you have is a four- or five-year-old bird out there, and there may be only one or two. Boy, you better be in the right spot to hear them gobbling or the right time of the season to hear them gobbling because they're just not gobbling that much because they've got all the hens they can handle. So you've got to kind of play with what the turkey population in your area is doing and sometimes for some of these areas that are in the mountains with ponderosa pine, and this is something else I thought of, I don't know about his area, but has it been affected by some of what we've seen in the past years about the beetle kill, the beetle infestation? If your timber habitats have changed dramatically, well, then the birds are going to adjust and shift their activity areas where they're going to have better pine forests, where you're going to have better pine seed production. So there's a lot of things that go into trying to figure out what's going on with your birds. But the bottom line is, this time, if you're talking about mountains right now, where's the snow line? Where's the green up? And are you finding tracks, strut marks, or can you at least lay eyes on birds, like you said, Jay, flying up on a roost? A lot of these mountain areas, you can be on that point, that bald spot, and you can cover ground with a set of binoculars. So, yeah, was work. Was there any more to his question or any follow-up question that he had, or did we cover that, it? I mean, that, that was, yeah, that was the gist of this, like, what the heck, you know, what, what do I do, you know, how do I go about trying to figure out where these birds are, and, and I think that's it. I, you got to put some boot leather on the ground and just start finding signs. Don't worry about trying to get a bird to gobble. Just are are they even there? You know, still use the the shot. You know, still use the locator call and hope to get lucky. But they just might be a much smaller population. They might be a hell of a lot more educated, and they just might be a little bit more tight lipped. So pick that place apart if it is from a seasonal standpoint if that is where those birds are likely to be now if you've got a bunch of snow they might be a hell of a lot farther down the mountain than you think another question here best time during the day to set up and call turkeys man i've killed more birds late morning i think i think i've killed more birds in the middle part of the day than i have killed off in the morning or evening i love if if no if you have to 
if no other consideration, midday hunts can be awesome. If you have the legal ability to do so, there's some, you know, New York, you have to stop at, at noon. Uh, some other states, like 1 p.m. If you have the ability to hunt all day, sometimes those midday hours are awesome. Where do you set up and w- what's your strategy? I'm going to be set up towards where the, you know, again, this goes right, this circles right back around to what we talked about in the beginning of, of their pattern, their, their, how they move across the landscape. Um, I'm going to be moving, uh, I'm not going to be necessarily near near a roost site. I'm going to be out in those areas where they tend to move off and loaf during the middle of the day. For me out here, we deal with a lot of wind, and I know there's a lot of places that deal with a lot of wind. If you're dealing with a lot of wind, one of the best places I've always looked is those sheltered, protected pockets. For us, it's river bottoms and cedars. So some river bottoms will have these, you know, maybe a bend in the river and there's a you know, a cut or a bluff or something like that where there's a big terrain break in the river bottom where the wind just goes up and over the trees and it just becomes a, a protected little pocket down underneath. Windy days, windy conditions in the middle of the day, those things can be dynamite. Same thing with cedar thickets. You get a big area of, of cedars. When if the wind is howling, sometimes they'll get into those cedars and the wind just goes right up and over those cedars. It's nice and calm, and, and they can get out of the wind, and they can be in the sun and just kind of mill around down there, and it's it's a great place to be in the middle of the day. I'm, I'm probably going to be several hundred yards away from where they typically roost. Good stuff. Uh, Chris, do you have any questions on your end that have come in or anything that you feel like we didn't cover? I think we, I really do think we touched on most of them. I did have a couple questions for you, though, uh, because even though you invite me on to this podcast, I do listen to your podcast. And I was, there's two things that It's nice I to know I of. have one listener. Hey. I just I just keep clicking like I, I just grab every <laughs> phone I download. I just try to I just try to get you know I, what was that you know I can't wait till election season. So my uh, three downloads are all from you on three different phones. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> correct. Hey, did I bump you up to three this year? That's uh, awesome. Yeah, it's awesome. Uh, well, first and, first and foremost, this is just a personal question to you. You used to, and I think I know the answer, but I'm just kind of curious. So you used to do a lot of. Rio Grande hunting in California. Why don't you do that anymore? So for probably, I don't know, seven, eight, nine years, um, I used to go over and hunt uh, in central California where I was born. We moved to Arizona when I was one, but I have family and my family has a bunch of uh, friends and such there in central California. And I used to go over would be the it would be right now I'd be the last Saturday in March uh, would be the uh, opener of turkey season in California and just absolutely loved it um, the family that we hunted primarily with there um, a few little changes and such with the property to make a long story short it just kind of got to where um, you know I had other family members hunting and it just it, it wasn't as good as it used to be so it kind of stopped doing that. But my nephews also used to live in Southern California, so it was a real easy trip for me to drive over there, pick them up when they were little tykes. Um, now they're both, you know, one six four and six three six four, and the other ones, you know, six six, which are big giant men. But uh, yeah, when they were just little guys, I'd pick them up and basically do a two or three day turkey hunt, so I could pick them up. Maybe they'd miss a half day of school, and you know, we could hunt. Uh, Saturday and Sunday morning and have them back to their moms um, and just kind of got out of a rhythm of doing that but you know always the last couple years when I haven't done it you know I see the California pictures of just the bright green grass you know just the beautiful um, pink flowers and just all of the you know that 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 area of the country in the spring is just dynamic it's a beautiful place if you ever get a chance to hunt california for turkeys you should and it's a multiple bird state at the time i think this has changed but at the time um you could only hunt till i believe 4 p.m so we actually couldn't do uh evening hunts 
Uh, but the turkey hunting was phenomenal. They were real grand turkeys. And yeah, I mean, I miss it every year. I need to get back over there. I need, if anybody's listening out, you know, if there's more than three people that listen to this podcast, uh, if you've got ground, good ground in central California, um, you need, you know, it's funny how I get contact from people. They don't even turkey hunt and they're like, oh, I'm just full of turkeys. You can come out and hunt. But if, if, Chris and I will, will volunteer to come out and hunt your property in California if you've got them. <laughs> Ab- um, absolutely. Yeah, so, but I love California for uh, turkey hunting. It's just beautiful. We had incredible time there. And, you know, my nephews, they kind of, that's how they learn to hunt, and they both like to hunt. Um, my youngest couple of nephews, they were there. They were too little to go at the time, and for, unfortunately, I wasn't able to take them out there. But um, that's kind of a long answer to your question. No, I, I no, it's perfect. I because I'm the same way. I mean, I remember looking at pictures out there from Turkey Country, and same same impact uh, that you just mentioned. Just the green as it's as it's greening up, just the the vivid green fields, and isn't some of that wine country too the vineyards and stuff and around that yep uh, yep there's, area. yep there's you know citrus is big you know and you get a little bit further wow. west and a little bit more north you've got a ton of vineyards and wine country and you know it, how 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 uh, okay so as much crap as we all give california and rightfully so i do know that california is like new york See, i grew up in upstate new york and i and i you hear you heard what i just said i didn't say i grew up in new york i said i grew up in upstate new york because whenever you say you grew up in new york everybody's mind goes new york city you know oh, do you, are there trees in new york yeah there's yeah there's trees in new york shut up so you, you've got to clarify you know when you say you're from california I understand we give Californians a rash of crap. Well, they however, deserve every however. bit of that. But, <laughs> yes, Chris, yes, you would not believe it. If you haven't spent much time there, there's actually I've unbelievable, unbelievable country. And the beauty of California is amazing. Uh, you know, unfortunately, a lot of that part of California, which I would say 80% of California is the prettiest place you've ever seen. And then you've got those big giant cities, but you know, central and Northern California is absolutely spectacular. And, you know, I think spring is their, is their shiniest um, season. You know, I think they, you know, it's just so green and so lush and so beautiful uh, in the spring. I encourage anyone listening, you know, get up around Sacramento and turkey hunt, get in that central, you know, Fresno area and turkey hunt, uh, Salinas, um, Napa Valley, you know, any of that stuff in there. It's just, it's it's unreal country. They've got great blacktail. Um, you know, it's, 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 an, it's an awesome state uh, for turkeys for sure. Now, I, I just remember seeing your pictures and talking to you back in the day about it and just being, man, that would be fun. I mean, how? what kind of a day would that be? We're going to go turkey out in the morning, and then we're going to go hit a restaurant, eat some really good food, drink some really great wine, and then we're going to hit repeat. <laughs> yeah. Okay? And, twist my arm. Yeah. Twist my arm. I can make that happen. Yes, yeah, we can. Yeah, you know, it's <laughs> – it's uh, you know, when this Gould's business really took off for me – it's really cut down on a lot of my other hunting. I used to hunt turkeys a lot and now I I'm in the field just as much, but you know, I'm not shooting them myself and and that's okay. Um, I have a real passion as you know, for Gould's turkeys and, and Mexico and you know, it's, it's basically getting to hunt birds that are uneducated and not called and they, you know, judging from, you know, the time, the couple of years you've been down with us, Chris, um, you know, you get to see, you get a lot of bird encounters, you know, you shoot a lot of birds at night, you shoot, meaning most of the time, you know, you shoot them mid morning, morning, and you know, it's kind of rougher at night. I, you know, it seems like our hunts in the evening in Mexico are just as good as our hunts in the morning. So it's, you know, I had, I had a day last year in Mexico where it was, you know, we killed uh, basically three birds in the morning, three birds at night. I had three guys each shooting two birds and we killed all our birds in one day. I mean, that's, 
well, I would I, mean, I wouldn't it, say common, but it's not uncommon to have you know multiple bird situations, multiple birds you know harvested in the same set, and um, that's what's you know and the Goulds they're especially beautiful with um, you know they're white on their feathers and all of that. So I mean I don't have to tell you you've seen it firsthand. Well, I know, and the thing that I thought was always just it was just funny to me is, um, you know your hunts are three days just like. Mine are, but you kind of you have the day in the front and the day in the back. The funny part is, is you you know the the, the hunters show up. We pick them up in the morning. We get to the ranch by early to mid afternoon, and you're like, oh, well, let's let's go out. Let's see what we can find. How many of your clients kill one or both of their birds the night before their hunt actually starts? Technically, a lot because the birds because the birds <laughs> just want to work. That's what I, yeah, ghouls, yeah, like I said, uneducated birds are a lot more fun than educated, well, I won't say, I can't say that's a qualification. They're easier than educated birds, but you have, ghouls just love to talk, and they just love to play. Yeah, and Rios I mean, are kind of, yeah, I'm, I'm in it for the encounters, and, you know, I, yeah. I, I get you know, I get a lot of emails and, oh, you just should try and you couldn't kill an Eastern. And I'm like, okay, well, that that's fine. I, I, I get that, that you have to work. But I would bet in a matter of a week, I see more interactions, hear more gobbling, see more birds strutting, see more birds die than they may see in four or five seasons. Correct. And And, yeah. and that's always been something with elk that I've told people, like, you know, I'm like, I'm around, I've, you know, guided in elk uh, for elk in Arizona for 20 years. I've hunted some of the best reservations in Arizona for years. I'm, you know, now at the Ot Six Ranch in Colorado. Like, I'm around vocal elk and have so many encounters every day. That experience, whereas maybe someone that's working their butt off in Idaho or somewhere where it's public ground and it's super hard and tough, I get it. But I value the, the interaction. I value the bugling. I value the gobbling. I value the strutting. I, I value high interaction. You know, whereas when I fish, I've kind of gotten to where my fly fishing, I, you know, I have days where I just want to catch fish on dry flies. And then I have days where I just want to catch one big fish. And I don't care if I catch a single fish as long as it's a big one. So, I mean, I get all of the sides of it with my turkey hunting i'm in a position where i just like the encounter i like to shoot the video i like you know i i, I like that interaction yeah no absolutely and, and and something you just said resonated as well as um i used to go to nebraska i would start my season in nebraska because they opened well i mean their season started already um yeah i'd start off in nebraska three birds bam 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 get back go back to colorado start on that go to kansas bam bam and, and you know just i used to just hunt a pile for myself Whoosh, i don't i don't now that now that i'm running the hunts i don't get the chance to to do that um but the beautiful thing is is we get to we get to play the game numerous times and get to see a whole bunch of turkeys get shot in the face a whole bunch of times and it's it's just as fun yeah, I mean, the passion's part- still there for both of us. You can tell the way we, we've yeah. been talking about it for three hours. Um, it's just a transition. You know, I've kind of just, and maybe one of these days I'll, I'll shift back where I'm hunting, you know, three or four or five states and, you know, shooting you know, four, five, six, eight, ten birds a year. Um, and maybe not. I may never kill another one again. I mean, it's, it's um, I'm super passionate about what I'm doing now and, um, it, it's exciting to have something to look forward to so much with, with the different things that, that I get to hunt. So I'm pumped about it. 